Hey guys, what's up? Aru. Dragons. The problem I have when talking about the term dragon is that there's just so many ways the game describes it. Actual dragons, weaker versions of dragons, which are called dragons anyway, dragon-like creatures. Even titles like overlords overlap with other gods and monsters, hybrid gods combined from dragons and chi lins. Finally, subcategories like drakes and names that basically translate to the same word. So welcome to another video of me and my confused screaming. For the sake of my own sanity as well as giving my own spin on the video, we're gonna be discussing as many creatures and gods as I could call dragons, the lore of each of these creatures, and finally a bit of speculation on each mentioned quote-unquote dragon. Timestamps down below, let's get started. The first and most recent dragon we'll be talking about is Apep, the dragon of Verger and one of the original dragon lords. Before the primordial one, or more appropriately, the heavenly principles, Apep ruled over the region of Sumeru. Apep's allegiances lie with the dragon king, Nibelung, or Nibelung, and because of that, Apep isn't really trusting toward humanity or the gods under the heavenly principles. Interestingly, the dragon of Verger, whose silhouette that almost takes up the entire new desert region, is only part of its entire appearance, as well as Apep being in a currently weakened state. Apep even mentions that it can destroy Sumeru and the Seven Nations if it was allowed to heal. And it's even more interesting that Apep holds knowledge of evolution, which could also mean that Apep knows about the origin of life. And following the principle that more knowledge equals more powerful dendro, you can imagine how powerful Apep is. Now what I'm wondering is what happened after the war between the Heavenly Principles and the Dragon Lords. This makes me think that Celestia really is sitting on a dying throne and is dormant because of what happened with the Dragons and the Heavenly Principles. Such a result from a war that happened long ago would explain why a pep is still standing unless Celestia just lets them live after the war. Now what if a pep let itself run amok all over Tevat instead of bearing and keeping the forbidden knowledge that it harbored at bay? We've seen what happens when elemental fungi are left with forbidden knowledge for a long time. Now imagine if a pep let that forbidden knowledge fester and embraced it instead of trying to hold it off. Similar to King Deshret which even a pep calls more insane than itself. You can only imagine what else would happen if the dragon of Verger let forbidden knowledge consume itself and destroy all of Tevat. Next is the overlord of the Geo Bishops. Ajdaha is the oldest of the Geo Bishops that was once a blind life form that caused earthquakes by simply moving. Until of course, he was unearthed by Zhong Li. Something about Ajdaha that I find interesting is its control of ley lines, which a pep, to my understanding, does not have control over. However, and weirdly enough, Ajdaha can't seem to harness Animo and Dendro. Ajdaha's true form and size is possibly larger than that of Dragonspine. Yeah, that's right, this guy is canonically supposed to be the size of a mountain. And from what I can tell, his tail is is supposed to be that of the huge tree in Yantian Men, as well as his whole body being covered with geocrystals similar to the resonating stones we see in the chasm, which explains his connections with miners hurting him when they accidentally mine ley lines in the chasm. Something of that scale would fit the description of causing earthquakes from merely moving an inch. Ajdaha, however, experiences something that its dendro friend doesn't seem to be affected by, and that's erosion, a phenomenon that even the archons themselves aren't immune to, and are trying their hardest to avoid and work around. TLDR erosion basically erodes people's memories as time passes by. Now I'm going to insert the Primo Geo Bishop here as well since they are nearly the same thing apart from being lesser forms of Ajdaha, with the information of the Draconic Calamity and their long wait to rise up again. I can't really say much actual lore about the Dragon of Water apart from the fact that it may or may not be already a dragon disguised as a human, but as bishops can adapt to their environment, they can also mimic those who defeated them, and in essence become the victors themselves. Tsumi, who is a reptilian, mentions that bishops and elemental beings hail from what's known as the Light Realm or Elemental Realm. Elemental beings are said to live the longest of all life forms, even among the gods, which is a terrifying thought when paired with their ability to adapt and copy its victors. The worst thought in my head is that the Dragon King is using forbidden knowledge and is evolving into a copy of the Primordial One, becoming the second one who came. And thinking about it, it's not really a far-fetched idea, considering we have a pep and evolution, Ajdaha and leyline adaptation, the baptismal bishops, 
becoming Visha people, and not to mention Duvalin and his connection with Venti. Fontaine is also just around the corner, and if this masquerade is a dragon lord disguised as an archon, then we're in for quite a revelation. It's weird too that the dragon of water is located in Enconomia, along with the Hydro Archon, who was favored by the Loach folk, becoming this pool of Amrita, which is akin to the pools in Enconomia guarded by the Bethesmal bishops, of which also have portals that transport you from place to place. This makes what Apep says about dragons growing closer to our kind even more prevalent if that is actually happening. Apep could just be talking about the Valin and Ajdaha, but there could always be more dragons, right? I mean, bishops can already get so close to humans that they themselves become humans. This same principle of evolution and adapting applies to the Primo Bishop as well. The Dragon of Wind and Sky, whose whirlwinds are so powerful that even the Thousand Winds could not fend off or replicate. Such is the power of elemental beings, and one such as the Dragon of the East upholds greatly. What I find weird about Duvalin is how he was born from the heavens, which leads me to think that Duvalin was born from Celestia through the grace of Animo, and met with Venti or Barbados in his time of rule which is as early as 2000 years ago, compared to the other Dragon Lords which existed even longer. This makes you wonder who, or if there ever was, a Dragon Lord of Animo. Unless Duvalin himself is the Dragon Lord of Animo that was reborn after the Heavenly War. Duvalin seems pretty susceptible to Venti's song as well as the Abyss's manipulations, compared to a pep who actively searched for forbidden knowledge twice, all while staying sane for possibly longer than 5,000 years. Whether or not a pep interacted with the Abyss Order at some point is unknown, but I'm comparing an entity who allegedly lived for 2,000 years with a Dragon lord who lived for more than five millennia. Dragons may be able to be reborn after exerting tremendous amounts of energy. As Nahida may become a branch and Marcosius becomes Goba, maybe the Animo Dragon Lord can become the Valin. And as the Valin is Animo and is tied to Venti, and theoretically by extension Easteroth, we may simply know less information than we're being let on. Mentioned by Apep as the Dragon King and the dragon who acquired the power of darkness from outside the world. The scale of one such as the Dragon King, or Naibalong, at this point is unimaginable when compared to the size of Apep and Ejdaha in their true forms. If Apep and Ejdaha, even Duvalin, could cause as much destruction, then imagine what a King of Dragons could do, and that's after interacting with forbidden knowledge. An interesting question, however, is Nibelung the sinner? If Nibelung was the one who brought the abyss to Tevat long ago, then would Nibelung be the first case of abyss corruption and forbidden knowledge? There's a story of the Ring of the Nibelungs that follows the struggle of gods, heroes, and mythical creatures vying for control of a powerful ring that can control the world. It's also related to a dwarf named Alberic who was given the title Nibelung, denoting the title Alberic's Ring. We already know that Clothar Alberic used the abyss after discovering the sinner, which is weird considering the sinner has the powers of the abyss, and whoever controls the abyss controls the world. The Gnostic Chorus mentions a pearl that is guarded by a serpent of darkness. Taking cues from a pep, maybe Nibelung also has the appearance of a serpent, and is now in possession of a so-called ring or pearl, a pearl that Nibelung or Alberic used to control the world. Because Nibelung and Alberic are so tied together that they are interchangeable, I can only think of Nibelung and Conria as well as the Cataclysm's events being related to each other. Durin is the only dragon that I can only surmise or theorize as to be created through Chemia. A disfigured skeletal dragon the size of Dragon Spine itself, which means he's probably the same size as Ejdaha if we followed the lore. Durin, to my understanding, doesn't have an element, unless you include the death and decay that it brings with it, which is a fitting ability for its title, Hummus. Apparently, Durin was unconscious when he brought destruction to Mondstadt, likely a measure by gold to keep Durin from conversing or interacting with the people on the surface, and even after waking up, didn't bore any ill will against them, which solidifies the reason reason why Durin should be unconscious. Interestingly, Durin's skull is facing Celestia after dying, likely the celestial heights it yearns for as it lived in the abyss. I can't say much about Ursa apart from meeting Vanessa's tribe and basically chasing them for 4 days until they reached Mondstadt. Ursa's appearance is similar to the Valin, walking on all fours but with a single set of wings on its back. Ursa, to my understanding, seems to be the size of an average house. But because we only have the manga to base his size from, he could be of course bigger. As for his element, I could make a guess that it's Pyro, unless this is just the sunset made to look like flames. 
Moving on, Zhang Li is not only an Archon serving under Celestia, he is also half Dragon and half Qi Lin. As to how that happened, nobody knows. Zhang Li, however, is the oldest and is one of the original Archons after the Archon War. And it raises some interesting questions like whether or not Zhang Li is familiar with dragons such as Apep and Nibelung, as well as how much Zhang Li knows about the Heavenly War between the dragons and the Primordial One. Other than that, we're still in the dark regarding Zhang Li. Orobashi as seen in Inazuma is a huge serpent that partook and lost in the Archon War. Hiding underground and meeting with Enkanomiya, finally having to be defeated by the Shogun for reading a forbidden book. Orobashi is a serpent god. With how the recent dragon of Verger Apep looks, Orobashi could very well be a quote-unquote dragon, even though it's not mentioned. But Orobashi's allegiances lies with the heavenly principles, hence why he wreaked havoc and was killed by the Shogun. Unless it was his care for Enkanomiya that made him do so. Orobashi is also responsible for research on the Vishaps to prevent the Dragon of Water from rising again, which is pretty counterintuitive to the Dragon Lord's plans. This leads me to believe that Orobashi isn't on the Dragon Lord's side, but Orobashi also loathes his existence and being ashamed for blasphemy. So maybe Orobashi sided with Celestia after they lost the war, but that's if he was actually one of the Dragon Lords to begin with. Osile is the demon god overlord of the Vortex. Osile also has a gripe with Zhang Li, wanting to settle quote-unquote old grudges, taking the form of a five-headed hydra made of water, which I think isn't its final form. Osile's translation to English was made to overlord, which is interesting considering bishops and dragons were once overlords of the old era. But Osile was never called a dragon, only a demon or an overlord, as well as Osile technically being already dead or sealed away by Zhang Li, hence possibly its current form. Haishan was described as a three-headed hydra, both fish and dragon-like. You can make an assumption that it looked like Osile, but Beidou's burst seems to show what Haishan looks like, if this is in fact Haishan. And ironically, it fits the description of a fish and a dragon. It does remind me of the Golden Wolf Lord, but Electro. Zhao also mentions the Haishan as a leviathan. But this makes you wonder more about Beidou and how she defeated Haishan, instead of Haishan itself. The entity known as Chi was a dragon-like sea monster that once claimed the Quincy region and was then defeated by Zhong Li. It seems that Chi was sealed up rather than actually defeated. However, similar to other gods and dragons that Zhong Li fought, quite a lot of them are only sealed and not actually killed. Based on the Chinese, Japanese, and Korean name, the appearance could be that of a serpent, along with real-life historical lore of them being dragons. With translations like Jiao Lo Jing and Mizu Chi, as well as serpent spine or chi bone spine translated to imugi sword in korean all of which point to mythical dragons or lesser dragons and there we go every dragon half dragon dragon like and whatever i could think of as a dragon a bit of lore and some speculation so let me know in the comments what you think of the word dragons and what you think of dragons as a whole in genshin also don't forget to like and subscribe as well as clicking on that bell icon to stay updated to more of my content i hope you guys enjoyed the video i've been wanting to make this dragon video for a long time and with a pep and naibolong in the mix i just had to now i won't take any more of your time so here's my other theory if you're interested so i'll see you guys in the next video yeah like comment if you enjoyed subscribe for more ramblings and stay mad theorists bye